So if you're curious, and you are, because otherwise you wouldn't be here, you have always wondered what are those things that you can see on the wing of a combat jet. Well, some of those elements actually are very well known, but some others don't seem to have a recognizable function. Well, obviously that's not the case. The wing is the most critical component of a combat plane. The wing largely determines the operational characteristics and the performance. Even the tactics used by the pilots largely depend on the wing features. Uh, here we are not talking about the pros and cons of the different platforms or the different aerofoils that can be used. Here we are talking of those small components that actually may really festoon the wing of a combat plane. Well, most of them are there to fix a problem. Most of the times the problem is of aerodynamic nature, sometimes it's a structural problem, and some other times it's just for mere practicality. Well, except for stealth. Well, let's cover this immediately because this is a sort of an elephant on the wing. So if you consider the F-22 and the F-35, they have a very clean wing. They have flaps, slats, ailerons, and that's it. And the Su-57 is similar, the J-20 is similar as well. In this case, stealth commands the design, not the aerodynamics. This means that the wing of stealth plane is generally not the wing you would have chosen if stealth was not a consideration. If you marvel at the performances of the F-22, then you may also have the doubt of what could have been if it didn't require a stealth wing. The competition for dynamics and high thrust to weight ratio engines actually do mitigate the problem, but still the problem exists. Fences are no longer common on combat planes, but they had a very important function in the history of aerodynamics. On a backward swept wing, the airflow has a spanwise component, which is basically caused by the sweep of the wing itself. This is not a detail because it is actually the reason why swept back wings do exist. You want to sweep back the wing to reduce the speed component, which is actually parallel to the aerofoil itself. Because in this way, the formation of sh uh, on the upper surface of the wing is actually delayed. In this way, the performance of the wing at transonic and supersonic speed is improved if compared with a straight wing. Why is this? because with the shock waves near the speed of sound also comes drag, the wave drag, and you want to reduce it to go beyond the speed of sound. So this spanwise flow may become important toward the tip of the wing to the point of actually cancelling the benefit of the sweep and forming the very first shock wave exactly there. And since the ailerons are at the tip of the wing as well, normally, this may be dangerous because it can cause a partial or total loss of control. So an obvious remedy is placing a fence somewhere on the wing. It is intuitive how a fence actually will or should straighten the flow and reduce the problem. Actually, fences tend to produce a tiny detached region in uh, the point where they intersect the wing, uh, and this increases the drag, but it is considered a good trade-off with the reduction of the spanwise flow and the reduction of the effect toward the tip of the wing. However, the effect of the fences can actually be more subtle. The lateral flow that moves above the fences 
generates actually a small vortex. If the angle of attack increases, this small vortex tend to grow and generate a system of vortices right out board the fence. This obviously creates drag, but it also generates lift. Yes, because the high speed spinning core of the vortex is a region of very low pressure and a region of low pressure actually sucks the wing upward in its proximity. It's a system of vortices similar to the system of vortices that generates lift on the delta wing. There are plenty of videos on the channel that describe this effect, so if you're interested, you can just go and watch them. Now, considering that flaps and slats lose effectiveness with the increase of the sweep, the vortices from the fences could be good, a good system to generate extra lift at high angles of attack. Now, fences are no longer used anymore. And well, the reason is that with the variable sweep wing, they're not needed because the variable sweep wing fixes the problem of the wave drag changing the sweep. More modern wings have less sweep, so the problem of the spanwise component of the flow well, is just less important. Additionally, more modern aerofoils, like supercritical aerofoils, well, actually do delay the formation of the uh, shock waves through their shape, so they don't really need the fences anymore. The Cushman carrots are bizarre elements <laughs> indeed. So they basically have the form of a carrot and they're placed on the trailing edge of the wing. Their purpose is still to improve the performance at transonic and supersonic speed. So Richard Whitcomb was an ACA engineer that in 1952 came up with a rather bizarre idea. So he had made a lot of experiments in the wing tunnel with slender aerodynamic bodies with wings. The bodies had different cross sections, but invariably it seemed that actually bodies that had the center of the fuselage pinched had a lower drag at transonic and supersonic speed. This was the famous Coke bottle shape. A fuselage shaped like a bottle of a Coke had the lowest possible transonic drag. So, after a lot of work, came up with a sonic area rule that seemed to offer guidance for transonic aircraft. To be fair, the area rule has been probably independently discovered at least a couple of times in the 40s, but the, say, the official historiography credits Whitcomb with the discovery, and we know that he did autonomously, but the stroke of genius of Whitcomb was to come up with a simple geometric formula to implement the area rule itself. So this is the rule, sorry, I need to read. If a wing body combination, including the external stores, is so designed that the axial distribution of the cross-sectional area normal to the airflow is the same as that of a minimum drag body, hmm? then the wing body combination will also have the minimum drag. <laughs> it's trivial, no? Okay, in practice and cutting a lot of corners. So take a slender body, like a carrot, that has the minimum drag attainable in transonic conditions with the same volume and the same length as the aircraft. Cut the body into slices like a salami. Measure the area of each slice. Now, do the same with the aircraft. If the slices of the aircraft have the same area as the slices of the slender body, then the drag generated by the aircraft is the same drag as generated by the slender body. 
Now, if you take the cross section of the aircraft where the wing is, since there is the yeah the shape of the wing, the area occupied by the wing, then the fuselage need to be narrower. But then what happens when the wing ends? What happens at the trailing edge of the wing? Well, the trailing edge of the wing doesn't really blend. It terminates abruptly. So the fuselage should actually also grow quite quickly, also abruptly eventually. And there are some planes in where this effect is actually very, very well visible. So if we don't want to abruptly change the section of the fuselage, then we can attach some slender bodies, smaller slender bodies, to the trailing edge of the wing. Those will provide a smoother transition of the cross section. Okay, I realize that this is not the simplest of the explanations. There is actually another way to understand how do they work. So on the upper surface of the wing, the speed reaches the maximum speed uh, pretty much where there is the maximum curvature of the wing is also the place where the shock wave starts forming because there the flow is faster so reaches uh, it approaches the speed of sound so in the area where the carrot is actually inserted so in the area where the carrot is mounted on the wing the local curvature reduced, is greatly reduced, and the formation of the shock wave is delayed. Carrot is a discrete element, uh, but at least in this case, rather than having a, a long shock wave all along the wingspan, it will be broken in different sections and will be more manageable. Another interesting advantage of the Cushman carrots is the fact that those early shock waves tend to be rather erratic. They move around quite a big back and forth on the wing and this creates buffeting because the shock wave the shock wave gives a small bump to the wing and this creates buffeting vibrations if you break the shock wave in different sections well you will probably multiply the frequency of the buffeting reducing it to a sort of a hum which is more uh, manageable in terms of vibrations because the risk is that if the frequency the, of the buffeting is similar to the resonance frequencies of the wing you may end up in big big troubles Additionally, the position of the carrots in respect to the wing torsion axis is such that they can be used to tune the frequencies at which the wing vibrates or resonates. So they can be used to control the vibration caused by the buffeting in more than one way. So teeth have a dual function. One, they generate the same kind of vortices generated by the fences, uh, which means that they increase the lift high angles of attack. Two, they increase the wing chord, leaving the thickness unchanged. And this is another way of actually reducing the local curvature of the wing and delaying the formation of the shock waves. In general, wings that have don't have very abrupt variation of thickness along the airfoils, less prone to generate these uh, strong and erratic shock waves. Additionally, the so tooth is often used as a, the obvious as most logical point of discontinuity of the wing twist. Yes, because all wings are twisted. Are are twisted toward the tip in a way to reduce the angle of attack of the section of, of the tip section of the wing. The reason is simple. In case of stall, you want the ailerons that are normally at the tip of the wing to stall last. So you still have some control even if the rest of the wing is stalled and you start falling. 
when the saw teeth are used on a delta wing that already has these kind of vortices to generate the lift their effect is quite interesting they generate a wing that has a complex uh, system of vortices and they normally produce a very high lift on the vegan it was introduced because attaching the weapon load below the fuselage and the wing actually caused a pitching a pitch down moment for the plane the pitch down moment was a bit too high to be contrasted simply by the elevons so they actually included uh, in the design uh, a tooth on the external section of the wing the pitching up moment generated by tooth was really enough to compensate the pitching down moment generated by the stores before you ask I have no idea of what are the streamlined bodies nearby the tooth. So today, with the availability of computational fluid dynamics, the wing can actually be designed in a way that doesn't need this kind of adjustments and corrections. Yes, because they definitely work well to fix the problems that we have described, but all of them are either complex, heavy, or generate some drag, so there's always a drawback. Okay, there is much more stuff that can be found on the wing of a combat plane. Spoilers, aerobrakes, vortex generators, uh, pylons. Modern fighter wings tend to be a lot cleaner. They have the maneuvering surfaces and then stop. Well, one of the reasons is stealth, as we have already seen, and that forces you to have a smooth surface to reduce the radar cross-section. However, fighters like the Eurofighter, the Rafale, they do have a very clean wing as well, even if they are not stealth. So, if you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please, as usual, like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell. Thank you very, very much for watching and see you the next time.